Euclid is a bedroom community tucked into the northeast corner of Cuyahoga County, hugging the shores of Lake Erie. It is quaint and quiet, a place where you wouldn't expect to see a list like this one. It shows that last year, think about this, the Euclid Fire Department administered 145 antidote injections designed to try and save the lives of people who had overdosed on opiates, including prescription pills, heroin, and fentanyl. 145 people, most were saved in Euclid alone. I wish that I could say that this was just a temporary thing and, it, and it's gonna go away, but it, it doesn't appear. It appears to be getting worse. Euclid is certainly not alone, although it's easy freeway access makes it an easy place for drug dealers to get off, do their business, and get back on the road. Most of the people saved last year by the Euclid Fire Department do not live in Euclid. What's happening here is an indication of what's going on countywide, that the heroin-driven epidemic is getting even worse, fueled by the rise of a killer drug known as fentanyl. And it has a potency about 80 times greater than morphine and perhaps hundreds of times greater than heroin, depending on how many times that heroin is cut. Like heroin, fentanyl is an opiate-based drug. Its legal uses include as a sedative for patients undergoing open heart surgery and as a painkiller for people battling cancer. Thousands of people in Northeast Ohio start on the opiate path towards drug addiction by taking legally prescribed painkillers, such as oxycodone and oxycontin. And now drug dealers are blending the two in a deadly concoction. We have never seen anything comparable to what we're seeing now. Not only do we see fentanyl in pill form, but this fentanyl is being sold as a look-alike for oxycodone. The medical examiner estimates that the number of people who abuse opiate prescription pills every year just in Cuyahoga County would fill First Energy Stadium. That's close to 70,000. He estimates the number of people who then graduate to heroin or fentanyl abuse would fill the queue. That's about 20,000. The medical examiner says the number of people who overdose and die each year in the county would fill a jet plane. Indeed, that number continues to rise. So far in 2016, it's on pace to be about 365 by year's end. That would be one overdose death every day. That number has gone up steadily over the last several years. So there really doesn't seem to be an end in sight. Once you get down into those depths, the only thing to bring you back up is to do it again. And the more you do it, the further that depth goes. Jason Sebaugh went through rehab at Cleveland Stella Maris Treatment Center. He thought he was buying heroin, but it was laced with fentanyl. <laughs> Paramedics here in Euclid and throughout the county carry with them naloxone kits, the antidote drug. Paramedics in Olmstead Falls injected Jason with three doses, and that saved him from dying from a fentanyl overdose. It is far more devastating than heroin could ever, ever be and doesn't produce the high? No, there's no high. I heard an addict say once, you know, we're not bad people trying to get good. We're sick people who are trying to get well. Metro's Dr. Joan Papp founded Project Dawn, which allows anyone to legally obtain the antidote drug in nose spray form for themselves or a loved one, even a friend, who may be fighting an addiction. Just the number of people saved by Project Dawn is staggering but it also shows how the problem continues to explode. We know that the success for remaining sober after even the best treatment is, is low, but what our program does is at least gives them a fighting chance. They'll go from unresponsive, not breathing, to coming right back, back to life. Last year, in one four-hour period, Chief Haddock's paramedics gave injections to four addicts who had overdosed. In particular, fentanyl deaths have exploded in Cuyahoga County in recent years, and so far this year, more people have died from fentanyl than heroin. Given its potency, that is a frightening change. Chief Haddock expects his paramedics and firefighters to be called on even more than 145 times this year to try and save someone who has overdosed on some type of opiate. It's gonna increase as much as 20 to 30 percent. I wish that I could see an end in sight. Sadly, in Cuyahoga County right now, the only end in sight appears to be that more lives will end this year from opiate addictions than ever before. The images are ones of lives near ruin, like we have rarely seen before. An Ohio couple slumped over from a heroin overdose with a four-year-old in the back seat. Images of people overdosing in stores or out on the streets. And the sounds? 
can be heartbreaking. A Youngstown father, Brendan Clark, telling his son that his mother has overdosed and died. Mommy died last night. Okay. What do you mean, my mom? Yes. How? From drugs. <laughs> I don't think your viewing public understands the magnitude of the carnage. It's not just a public health crisis, it's a plague. A plague, drug court judge David Mattias says. What do you need help with? That is killing more Americans than a war. Vietnam, the number of people who died in Vietnam was 58,000. We're almost losing that every year. And how many years are we into that? It's now been almost five years since the I-Team first traveled to Southern Ohio to report on an emerging crisis. I relapsed while I was pregnant with her, and I used until three weeks ago. People overdosing in record numbers on heroin and its legal cousins, opium-based painkillers such as oxycodone and oxycontin. Ohio has been a particularly hard hit, no question about it. Chuck Rosenberg runs the DEA, the nation's Drug Enforcement Administration. Sometimes we overuse certain words like historic or unprecedented. This is an epidemic. We're going to lose 47,000 people this year to a drug overdose death. And remember, in some ways, that number is a significant undercount because we have many, many, many more people who overdose but don't die. Indeed, just in the small town of Euclid, records show its fire department administered naloxone, the heroin antidote drug, to 145 people last year alone. I wish that I could say that this was just a temporary thing and it's going to go away, but it doesn't appear. It appears to be getting worse. What's driving the increased demand for heroin and its opiate cousins? One of the things driving the increased demand for all opioids are prescription pills. We know that four out of five new heroin users started on pills. And most people got those pills legitimately, at least at some point. Given that statement from the nation's top drug enforcement official, you might expect other government policies to encourage doctors to be more careful, to prescribe fewer opiates for their patients to manage pain. But in fact, the opposite is true. Federal policies put pressure, financial pressure, on doctors to prescribe more opiates in the middle of a heroin epidemic. We know that physicians across Ohio feel strongly that they are being pressured. My colleagues tell me that the, the pressure is, is extremely uh, intense and that oftentimes, you know, these patients have been on these medications for years. Both Dr. Jason Jerry at the Cleveland Clinic and Dr. Joan Papp at Metro say they are grateful that their hospitals do not reduce individual doctors' pay based on how patients rate their pain treatment on government surveys. The same is true at university hospitals. Doctors' individual pay does not go down based on patient surveys about pain control. The messaging is always the same, which is practice good medicine. And so an opioid sometimes is appropriate and sometimes it's not, but it's not based on an HCAP question at all. HCAPS is the name of the federal survey given to Medicare patients after hospital stays. There are two pain questions, one on pain control and one asking if the hospital staff did everything they could for pain. Patients are given four choices, and if they don't answer always to both paying questions, the amount of money the government pays the hospital for their care goes down. Several hospitals across the country do structure their payment that way. A study of 1,100 doctors just in Ohio found 74%, about three out of four, felt more pressure to prescribe opioids because of how the government reimburses for pain control. It's unrealistic to believe that they're not going to cave into that pressure in some cases. What patients want is not all, always the best medicine. Dr. Jerry says all physicians know that reimbursement may go down to their hospitals and they know that patient satisfaction scores matter a lot. You feel that, and, and what are you doing wrong, and uh, that you know, your, your satisfaction scores aren't up to snuff with the, with the rest of the institution. And ask the drug court judge, who sees lives ruined by prescription pills every week, She's going to be dead. Ask him about patient scores influencing doctors to prescribe more opiates, and he'll tell you. It is the exact opposite of what the medical profession should be doing. So what should be done? There are many solutions. We have to attack supply. That's the traditional law enforcement response. But we also have to attack demand. 
and attacking demand may mean changing a system that encourages doctors to prescribe more pills during an epidemic when people are dying in warlike numbers, one by one. I'm so sorry. Bill Shield, Fox 8 IT. There are things in this interview that are probably going to cost me my doctor. They're probably going to cost me my supply of marijuana. I don't care. This has to get out. Bob Ellison is nothing if not a survivor. Bone on bone in your right knee? Bone on bone arthritis in my right knee. Painful? Very painful. The flow of pain was constant, so Bob's doctor put him on an opiate, Vicodin. But over time, Bob says his body built up a tolerance and he needed more pills to stem the pain. Doctors told Bob that in his mid-30s, he was too young for a knee replacement without risking that he'd later wind up in a wheelchair. So he took the pills and started to become a drug addict. I was taking 12, 14, 16 pills a day. I was supposed to be taking three. And at night, Bob would lay in the dark and say the same silent prayer. Please God, don't let my wife find me dead from opiates in the morning. And every time that happened, I was braver and I would take one more pill that day than I did the day before. But worried that he was going to die soon, Bob made a radical choice to transition from opiate pills to marijuana to help manage his pain. This isn't some stoner stereotype about getting high, man, and playing hacky sack and all that. No, this is people's lives. This saved my life. A 2014 study in the Journal of the American Medical Association concluded that states that have legalized medical marijuana have about a 25% lower average death rate from drug overdoses than other states. Another study found marijuana helped by 30% or more to control chronic pain, the reason people like Bob turned to it. I want to take medical marijuana for pain because I don't want to be an opiate drug addict. I was an opiate drug addict. That concept that you can use marijuana to treat chronic pain is highly controversial. Many experts regard marijuana as a so-called gateway drug, one that leads to harder drugs. The government schedules many opiates on what's called Schedule II, drugs that can be abused but have some medical value. But marijuana? Marijuana is scheduled as Schedule I, meaning the government sees it as having no medical value. Is it harder to study if it's Schedule I than Schedule II or Schedule III? It's harder because there are more restrictions on it, absolutely. But the restrictions are there for a reason. But the most important thing, it's not impossible. We also have to just end the DEA monopoly on medical marijuana research. At a Senate hearing this year, several lawmakers pushed to change the law to allow more marijuana research. I know some people are saying that we should wait until there's more research before changing the laws. But the one thing that's blocking the research is the law. The DEA schedules drugs based on a review of scientific studies conducted by the Food and Drug Administration. But in its most recent review, the FDA found only 11 studies that met its criteria. The FDA said 11 studies was too small of a sample to draw conclusions from, but added, quote, the studies reviewed produced positive results suggesting marijuana should be further evaluated as an adjunct treatment for neuropathic pain. And here's what the FDA told Congress. There is a perception that being in Schedule 1, marijuana is somehow less attractive for research. And, and, and I've heard that, and I think Dr. Weiss has heard that. Changing that perception, I think, has the potential to be powerfully important as far as supporting better research. We now know from the experience of millions that there are benefits of medical marijuana. We know that broad uh, coalitions of medical professionals believe that marijuana should be an option uh, for medical purposes. If marijuana was killing people, it would be on the news. It would be in the paper. It would be an epidemic. It's not. Opiates are the epidemic. A lot of studies have not been done simply because of the classification that the drug currently has. Which prevents doctors from learning more about how marijuana may or may not treat pain. I believe the additional research would certainly be helpful. Marijuana can kill you one way. If it falls out of an airplane, if somebody throws a bale of it out of an airplane and it hits you in the head, that's the only way marijuana is going to kill you. Like other drugs and alcohol, marijuana certainly can contribute to deaths, most notably if drivers are high and kill someone in the trauma of a car crash. But in Ohio, more people now die from heroin and other overdoses than from all types of car accidents, whatever their cause, combined. And Bob says marijuana doesn't have the awful withdrawal symptoms that opiates can. 
His doctor had wanted him to stay on opiates, though he said new rules on prescribing them meant Bob would have to come in more often. The doctor looked at me and said, this is what the uh, DEA wants, so fine. I'm going to get rich peddling dope to you. That's what your doctor said? That's what my doctor said. Bob doesn't favor marijuana abuse, just its medical use for people like him. People trying to control severe chronic pain without overdosing on opiates. I don't think that I would still be alive if I was still on Vicodin and not using marijuana. It saved my life. Bill Scheel, Fox 8 I-Team.